Thank you guys so much for coming. I know it's, uh, I know it's um, minutes away from happy hour, from, from the uh, social uh, networking event. So appreciate you guys all coming over. Uh, we're going to have a, a friendly chat about augmented reality today. And I welcomed uh, on board some folks. Um, and so my name is Vinny De Silva, and I'm with Vuforia. I'm a product evangelist, um, and also do product management for Vuforia Engine. And uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's get started with some, some chats here. So uh, over here on stage, we have Franz, we have Danny, and we have Scott. And uh, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce each other. There you go, Mike's working. Hi, everyone. So my name is Franz. I'm the co-founder of Visionaries 777. So we are a company based in Hong Kong, specialized in AR, VR, MR, XR, how you call it, uh, design and development of uh, applications. And we have a strong focus on uh, the automotive industry. Um, and yeah, we've been uh, doing that for like the past five years now, based in Hong Kong. Hi, I'm Danny Parks. I'm the Senior Director of Technology at Trigger Global. Uh, we're an LA-based um, mixed reality studio. Uh, we've been around since 2005, uh, when I joined in 2013. And I'm Scott Mocha. I am a executive producer for 40 Pipeline, and we specialize in just about everything 3D. Uh, we do a lot of VR, AR, but we also work in pipelines and uh, anything that has to do with real-time or rendered uh, 3D. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And we're going to have a chat here, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can use augmented reality in the automotive industry. Um, I'd love for you guys to tell, tell us about some of your projects and some of your successes. So just a quick, easy one here to get started. I'm um, just really curious as to why you guys want to use AR in your projects and sort of where does it bring the most value? Yeah, I guess I've got the mic, so I'll go first. Yeah, um, yeah so AR for us is kind of our, our bread and butter. Um, you know, it's getting to the point now in the industry where it feels like table stakes is doing AR. Um, just doing something digital isn't enough anymore. Uh, just doing something physical uh, doesn't have the same kind of reach. Um, so AR is, is, you know, getting to that point where we're, we're bringing the, that digital space into the into the physical world, um, and you know, it's something that there are so many applications for it that you know everyone wants it, um, and it's such a an impactful tool. Being able to go, uh, you know, take whatever kind of you know data visualization, um, entertainment piece, IP, and bring that into the world around you um, is is really exciting for for everyone in kind of every space. I think for us, it's uh, it, it's it's one of the most exciting ways to integrate like cutting edge technology with the world. And uh, it's like the things that so many of us have dreamed of for years. And it's fun to be able to take these uh, highly techni technical solutions and implement them in ways that, that take people's breath away. I mean, if you can create that emotional experience in a learning application, that, that's cool. Um, so AR is, is fantastic for that. And, uh, and it's just progressed so much. Um, it just keeps getting more and more used, and, and we dream every day of new ways to use it. So I, I look forward to every single day. So um, for myself, basically, um, I uh, went to work for Lego in, in 2009 uh, in the R&D department, and I was uh, heavily looking into AR, how to bridge the physical and the digital world. As we know, like kids, they love to play with video games, uh, but how can we keep um, the physical toys um, to matter and uh, enhance it with uh, digital, with uh, potentially AR, without completely taking over the physical. And I think this is really important, and what we try to keep as well in our projects uh, applied for automotive. The physical world, it's still around us, and we cannot get away with it. And uh, the physical, uh, emotional values of of, uh, of the world, of the objects, of the textures, the feelings. We need to keep that, but then use digital uh, to enhance it, to tell more stories about it, to explain things that you cannot see that could, could be under the hood of the car, like uh, mechanical structures, etc. There's so many things that we can explain so much better with AR than any other uh, technology. 
So yeah, like we, we really strongly believe in AR uh, that, that is the future either in its handheld or with wearable devices. Uh, that's just a matter of um, uh, logistic and how you want to use it. But yeah, we see it as a, a future technology for, yeah. Great, thank you so much. So I know you guys have tons of experience with different projects and making them successful. And I was just curious, sort of uh, any, kind of any kind of best practices you guys would recommend for folks starting off in AR? Yeah, I think for, for us, one of the first things that we, um, that we always ask as we're in, entering into an AR engagement is what is the use case? What are we really trying to solve for here? Because technology is cool, and cool is always fun, but unless it does something or actually achieves something or brings about some sort of a, a return on the time investment, the money investment, then it's just pointless. Uh, and, and with AR especially, it's, it's something that you can use to a level that would change an experience for a user. So if you can find that, if you can target that, it will guide your path the whole way through and keep you from making something that's just overweight and, and, and not usable. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, for us, it's kind of like, all right, if you are just using AR to display a thing, it, you know, hey, look, there's my 3D model in the world. Great, good job. You know, that's, there is something to that, right? That, that's got value in its own right, but, you know, that's, that's step one. Like, that's step zero. You, you need to do that and then. Um, and so, like Scott was saying, like, understand what it is that you're trying to do. What, is, what, is, what does AR give you that you couldn't do with just a digital thing? Because everybody's got a phone in their pocket. Everybody can access the web. You know, why does it need to be in your world? What is, what is that extra affordance of AR doing for this project? Um, and then kind of I'll add on to that. As a developer, what you need to do is you need to get it on device and put it in the world and look at it as often as possible. Eat your own dog food. Play it as much as you possibly can. It's one thing to like, you know, sit down and, and drop your storyboards, write your code, look at it in Unity, but until you get it on device and until you start playing with it, it's, a, it's an entirely different animal. Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, like the, the meaningfulness of uh, applying AR is very important. Like it needs to, to make sense. Like uh, it's just, uh, if you are displaying a model running on a table, then that's cool. It feels like a hologram, but can we do more about it? Like, is it uh, with a physical uh, gestures around that uh, you interact with the, with the character, things like that? Um, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, this, this things needs to make sense. And, uh, like, as you said, like, uh, you need, we need to try as much as we can. Like, um, AR is very much uh, about using physical uh, gestures around an object, uh, moving closer, further, um, having, like, it's, it's not the same as designing a UI on a, on a 2D screen. Uh, so you have, like, 3D space relationship with objects, you need to, a lot of try and error in iterations when you're actually developing a, an application. So what we actually were, when I was working at Lego, we did a lot of kit, kit tests because also like users are very uh, important, the, the end user, and when you're uh, presenting an app to kids, it needs to make sense, it needs to be very straightforward. Uh, so the way you design your interface needs to be understandable. Um, and uh, yeah, interaction, iterations with users is really, really important because uh, everyone is going to have different behaviors uh, using AR, and you cannot just uh, avoid this. Like, uh, there's no way. Cool. Uh, so, so Danny, you just mentioned some affordances in AR. Can you just go into some of those? Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit more and talk about what are some of those affordances in AR? Yeah, so um, you know, AR is an interesting medium in that uh, you know, if you're coming from the, the world of, of games or even film and television, um, you as a, as a digital creator are kind of in, in charge of that camera, right? Like what is the user seeing at any given point? With AR, you have no idea, right? Like it's, it's a little bit like VR problems where you put the cool stuff here and the user spent the entire time watching the backstage, right? Um, with AR, it's, it's that, but worse. They can wander off and you know, not even be involved anymore. 
Um, so it, it is a challenge, but at the same time, um, being able to guide the user to really fully explore the content from 360 degrees, um, six degrees of freedom, um, being able to interact with that content in new and exciting ways, um, you know, this, this is something that, that Pure Digital has, has really struggled with. Um, and, you know, again, putting it in your environment, making it field anchored, uh, using light estimation, right? Like, grab that skybox, um, light probes, um, ambient occlusion on the ground, make things feel like they're part of your world, uh, get shadows in there, you know, do everything you can to, to trick, the, trick the experience into like, yeah, this is in my world, this is amazing. I can move around with it and it's, it's part, of, part of what I'm dealing with. Cool, thank you. And um, so you guys all had very similar answers in the, in the sense where you guys are all talking about AR experiences that make sense. Can you guys talk about some of your experiences that make sense and maybe some of the don't? You know, some of the, the things that you guys tried and it didn't work out? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to go into all of the things we tried and didn't, didn't succeed with. Um, you know, it's, it's, I guess I could talk a little bit about our, our evolution in, in, in AR. And in the beginning, it was very much, okay, yeah, let's look at a piece of digital content and just put it out there, right? Let's have... Um, you know, a, a character from a film, and he's just standing there, and isn't that cool? Um, and yeah, that's pretty cool, but you know, okay, what is the story we're telling there? Is it, you know, okay, I wanna take a photo with my friends, and I want Spider-Man to be in it. Okay, that's a little more interesting than if it's, you know, all right, Spider-Man's on my table. That's kind of cool too, but you know, looking at what's next, um, you know, we've kind of gone the full spectrum of here's just a, a a digital blob, and yeah, maybe it looks amazing to, on the other end, now we're, we're doing, you know, we've got um, Hot Wheels Hawk Moto up there, and it's a physical toy fully controlled by a digital experience, um, and kind of that, that layering on and, and mixing of the physical and the digital is really exciting for us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would completely agree with that, and I, one of the challenges, and I guess one of the ways that we've failed, uh, not that we would have ever failed, but I mean, AR as a, as a as an idea is uh, you, you gotta you've gotta ask yourself the, the the big question, and the big question should always be why, um, because as you're interacting with AR, as you're developing in AR, there are massive limitations to what you can do and render in real time in a convincing way, and so if you're going to harness those limitations, if you're going to embrace those, why? Why not do pre-rendered 3D? Why not create a movie? Um, and I'd say the biggest failures that I've experienced in AR are when I didn't ask that question. And I totally came to the table with something that I thought was cool because it was cool for whatever reason. And somebody would come to me and say, well, why is this important? And I, if you don't have that answer, then go a different route because that is the key. Uh, the, the why is the way. I think the like uh, working around the constraints it's it's quite important as well so uh, as you said like uh, with AR we we are limited to a certain extent in terms of uh, rendering in terms of distance with the if it's a marker an object or the real world location uh, there's always constraints and we need to to kind of play with these limits like if you leave it totally uh, open and and crazy maybe the ex user experience is going to be terrible uh, so you need to constrain the user so that he cannot do things that wouldn't look good. Like uh, so, um, so just that you make sure that the experience at the end it's perfect for the user. Like uh, each, the, there are things that they shouldn't see bugs, they shouldn't see things that are not supposed to happen. Uh, so playing with the constraints. One of the things that now becomes a bit difficult is that uh, all these AR SDKs available are becoming so stable and robust uh, that uh, you, you still have constraints, but they are less visible. So you tend to put too many things and uh, make it a bit uh, too crazy. But back in the days when we were working with uh, AR, kit, uh, AR toolkit, sorry, uh, those uh, black and white markers, we were very limited. And we had to play around those constraints and design, design gameplay experiences 
based on that. And actually, when you are so limited, it's easier to design things than when it's totally open. So that's, that's one of the things that, uh, yeah, for best practice. Yeah, that's a great, great point, France. All right, so now we're going to look a little bit into the future. And uh, I'd like you guys to sort of, you know, maybe not not necessarily speculate, but sort of talk about some of the technology you guys are looking forward to, uh, so that way you guys can use your own projects. Um, I know obviously there's some things that you guys can talk about, but love to hear about some of the technologies you guys are looking forward to. Uh, one, of, one of the technologies that for us we always dream about is to have uh, fully uh, dynamic uh, occlusions. So for example, in order to make AR objects believable in the world, we need them to be um, uh, we need to, to be able to, to integrate them in the world perfectly. So if uh, a character is walking behind a chair, it should be occlu occluded by this uh, physical object. And this today is still very difficult. There are some uh, experiments that work uh, to a certain extent, but this is still like we are quite far from it, like with today's devices, um, so it, it works a bit, but uh, not uh, perfectly. So if we could get this perfect, then it would be amazing. We could really create uh, amazing uh, augmented reality experience and make it s super believable in the world. Um, yeah, so I've got a, a list of stuff that I'm really excited to see coming. Um, you know, web AR is gonna be amazing. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna change the game. Um, you know, if, if I put on my, my wizard hat and look into the crystal ball really far out, kind of the idea that you, right now, in order to interact with a digital world, you have to take out your phone, right? And you've got this, this slab of glass in your hand, and it has a terrible field of view if you hold it up to your face, right? Um, if you just imagine that that is gone, and to interact with the digital world, there is no interface, right? It's just a seamless interaction in, in the same way that, that we um, interact with the physical world. Uh, that is a radical change in how we approach technology, how we approach content in general, both the physical and the digital. Um, and yeah, it's a long way out, but um, I think there's definitely value in kind of looking at that now and, and shaping your, your mind to, to think towards that. What, what is that going to allow us to do? Because every step we're taking is, is moving us a little further in that direction. Um, you know, the pure processing power on your device, uh, you know, just the number of polygons you can push, the fidelity of the rendering, that's just only going to get better and better. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be in, in this space um, because so much is changing so quickly. Uh, you know, the, the difference between, um, you know, not being able to everything needing to be tied to a marker or just gyro based to now, you know, we can have slam, we can have, um, you know, a, a basic understanding of the physical space around us. You know, where's, where's the edge of this stage? Um, where's the floor? Things like that. You know, that's, you know, what used to take, you know, a connect and a, a piece of hardware and, you know, LIDAR scanning the room, right? Like now that's just optically based on your phone. Um, you just imagine like what's coming next. It's, it's a really exciting time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, hardware, as hardware progresses, it's gonna be really exciting to see where that goes and, and, and that line uh, between uh, obvious reality and what's virtual will be, will be blurred. But I, I think in the more immediate short term, what's really got me excited is, is some of the standardization that's happening. Uh, with, with as early as, or as, as young as AR and VR are as technologies, um, there have been so many different formats and different ways to get into or from something from like CAD all the way into AR or VR. And now we're seeing things like GLTF and USDZ and these different file formats that are coming out. Some are open source and, and really are being created with the idea of, of transporting this stuff really quickly into Unity or, you know, and, and give you the ability to take what you've built and immediately visualize it in the world. And, uh, and that's like mind blowing for engineers and, and people who have been designing things for years to be able to take something they've designed and actually see it in front of them. Um, I mean, that's, that's here and that's happening right in front of us. It's cool. Oh, you guys set your bars really high. I mean, I just want my phone to last more than a day, the battery. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, all right, cool. So, um, so question here. I know you guys all have used V4 in the past before Engine, and I'm just curious as to you know sort of you know you know how do you guys use V4 Engine to power your AR experiences? So for us, we, we choose Vuforia because um, it's uh, the most complete, like it supports uh, AR Core, AR Kit uh, with Vuforia Fusion. And uh, we've been working with it like since, uh, since the beginning that it started. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to integrate with Unity. That's the, that's the main point. Like Vuforia uh, um, is always pushing for updates. Um, and recently with, uh, with Model Target, it really gives uh, something uh, really powerful to bring these experiences to something that is not only for gaming but uh, for the the enterprise level, like something professional, like when when you're when you need to uh, detect uh, a car life size with uh, reflective surfaces, uh, that becomes really really tricky, especially when you have spotlights like here, for example, on a, an auto show. Um, so yeah, V4 is very, uh, very strong. It's, it's developing uh, very well. Yeah, I, th I think you, you nailed it. Um, for us, it's it's that ability to be cross-platform, right? To to reach as many devices as you can. Um, you know, we're not just in that AR kit, AR core box. We go all the way back. Um, the graceful fallback, right? You don't have to write your own wrappers. To, to plug into a particular um, device or SDK. It's, it's, it's going to be an umbrella. It's going to cover everything for you. Um, and it's going to you know, give you image targets, model targets, cylinder targets. Like the, All of the things that we know and love in Vuforia um, are there and incredibly easy to use. Right? It's been around. It's a, it's a mature SDK. It's a great platform to develop on because it is so kind of straightforward and easy to use. Um, and it gives you such a reach that it's, it's kind of, if we can get away with it, we're, yeah, let's use Vuforia, let's do it. Because, you know, it's, it's one less thing to worry about. We know it's gonna work. Yeah, yeah uh, we just uh, finished a, a project, or it's actually ongoing with BMW Mini, where uh, the, the, the target platform was an, uh, an iPad Air 2. Does anybody still have an Air 2? Uh, so we had to find some, but uh, the only way that we could support that technology was to use Vuforia, and I, you know that, that's that's a really great use case because it, it does give you that reach to go as far back as you need to go. But we've also used uh, the user-defined targets have have been amazing um, as we're trying to look for ways to to like we're we're changing uh, the wheels on these cars and and for the BMW. And we have to use user-defined targets to do that. And, it, and as we looked for a way to do this without markers, without knowing what kind of wheel we were going to be using, we couldn't use CAD tracking because uh, you never know what the wheel is going to be. So how do you do that? Well, Vuforia gives you an answer um, in that you can just have the user pick it. And it really changed the way that we could look at, um, at AR in general because you can't always go markerless. I mean, we, we'd love to, right? But it doesn't always make sense. You need things to line up a little bit closer. And, uh, and Vuforia just gave us the way to do that. Cool. All right, so earlier I asked you guys to sort of look into the future and kind of tell me you know, some of your thoughts and what you guys are looking forward to. Now I'm going to ask you guys to sort of look back and think of yourselves in you know, a pre-AR and sort of, you know, if you could have a conversation with yourself back then, um, you know, what, what, would you, what advice would you give yourself back then? Like, what did you wish you knew before you got yourself into AR? That I wasn't going to need to carry that big computer around with me. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't know if anybody else had ever had to do that, like tethered to a gigantic machine just to do a little bit of AR with multiple cameras and, yeah. Um, really, uh, open your mind. Uh, you know, let go. Step away from the limitations and uh, dream bigger. Dream uh, bigger. That's, yeah. a great, that's a great advice. Yeah, I, th I think it goes back to um, you know, the idea that there, there needs to be a why, right? When it's, when it's first starting out, it's just enough to, to have a digital thing in the physical space. Um, but, but think bigger, right? Like, why am I doing this? Like, what is, what is the, the benefit to this? Um, we have so much digital content available to us. What, what part of that can I bring into this, this physical space that's going to make it that much better? Um, 
you know, and, and just looking at, okay, in the beginning it was really hard to do AR at all. Um, and so it was enough to, you know, oh, you did something in AR, great. Uh, but if you start from, okay, we know we can do that, what else, what's next? Um, and really just pushing, pushing to ask that question at every step of the way. Yeah, I think back, back then uh, when I started uh, working with AR, basically it was my thesis project uh, at university and um, everything was basically research papers from SIGGRAPH and, and all those uh, conferences. So nothing was really like uh, hype uh, like now. Uh, so we had, we had to dig uh, to like see what's possible, what, can, what kind of software you can use. So back then we were using uh, VirTools, but not Unity. Um, and uh, and uh, we had to use like those uh, AR toolkit uh, markers, um, and it was quite difficult to get an application running uh, and try things and uh, see, like basically understanding the limitations, understanding what's possible to do. Um, now with all the knowledge from today, it's like it's very much different. Yeah. Great. I know for me personally, one of the things that I I sort of wish I I would tell myself or one of the things I knew before I started is just, you know, how, how much lighting is important when it comes to our experiences and, uh, you know, control it when you can and, and learn to deal with it when, when you can't. Um, cool. Um, and uh, so now a little bit more specifically re related to automotive, can you guys talk a little bit more about some of the, um, some of the ways that AR can benefit automotive projects? Sure. Um, so for us, uh, we really see that AR for automotive is really important, uh, especially when it comes to explaining technologies. So now, as you can see, cars, basically it's a computer on wheels. Uh, it's connected, it's got electric batteries. Uh, all of this uh, is gonna be even more relevant in the future. Um, so visualizing these technologies and understanding it, it's very important, especially for non-engineer uh, customers, uh, not everyone buying a car is a, an engineer, a born engineer. So you need to explain how these technologies are going to benefit the customers on the road. So in order to do that, you can use AR to visualize uh, the hidden powertrain in, uh, inside the, the, the chassis um, and how the energy is like gathered and uh, it distributed to the wheels, uh, all that stuff. Uh, so visualizing it with AR, AR to something that makes sense, understandable, it's really important. Um, as well as, um, um, you know, dealerships, they, they are facing issues of, in terms of space, in terms of uh, people coming to dealer, the dealerships. Everyone now is like connected to internet. So how do you uh, maybe minimize space um, with, with a, uh, a dealership and uh, put it into a, a, an area with more traffic, like a a mall, um, but use AR to uh, display uh, other information around the car um, and virtual reality as well, like uh, VR can be also very useful to display things, uh, information that are not available in this dealership, uh, other colors, other trims, etc. So all this AR, VR, XR is, is really important for, for automotive in that sense. Yeah, for us it, it you know, it's, it, there's so many avenues of, of automotive that, that this can touch uh, because it's such a powerful technology, right? You know, from all the way from the design, you know, automotive designers, um, you know, they're working in clay now, uh, you know, digital clay. Okay, well, can they bring that into the physical space? Um, it's a lovely musical accompaniment. Um, all the way through, you know, maintenance and construction, being able to add kind of that, that support layer of, all right, I don't know where this widget goes. How do I install this? Um, I need some support here. Let's call back to, uh, you know, home base and, and get a, an expert in here um, without having to fly somebody across the country. Um, the dealership experience, like Franz mentioned, was, you know, being able to go beyond what is, what is available in a, a pamphlet or a brochure. Um, telling stories in that dealership space. Um, you know, if, if every car can be its own commercial, that's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, that home ownership experience. Um, you know, like, I'm interested in buying this car. What does it look like in my driveway? Okay, well, we can do that now. Um, or, you know, oh, I own this car, but 
it doesn't work. Maybe I can, you know, I'm not a mechanic, but maybe the, the, the this app can help me with that. Um, so, you know, every kind of step along the way can benefit in some way from AR. Uh, and they're having fun over there, huh? I wish I brought my soundtrack. Uh, yeah, I think it's your cue to sing, actually. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, you nailed it. I, like, for us, uh, Mini right now is such a customizable car. It's, I mean, you can make it anything you want. And um, what, what we've provided for uh, BMW World, I mean, it's being shown in Munich, is uh, anybody can come in and customize their Mini right in front of their face and see exactly what they want and make that buy decision right there. And, I mean, it's a, it's a very simple but very effective way to use AR. Um, some of the other ways that we're using it currently or, or helping other people use it is, uh, is through maintenance and, and uh, basically trying to help the mechanics do things in certain ways. I think you hit on those. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool to do that when you're triggering like AR animations off of some of the, the objects inside of a car engine so that you know, a mechanic can open the hood and see how to solve a problem that maybe he'd never been able to work with before. Um, those are the things that are right in front of us, and, and they're, they're really working well. Cool. Thank you so much. So one of the things that I know I find challenging in AR is uh, user experience and user sort of um, usability in general. Mm -hmm. So can you guys talk a little bit about so your approaches to, to UX when it comes to augmented reality? Absolutely. I, I was talking to the guys ahead of time. I, I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and uh, one of the tests I love to throw to my three-year-old is I let him see it. And if he's bored, then it's probably a little bit too advanced. Um, but really, I mean, it, it, that's, the, that's the whole way you have to work with this, is you've got to make it easy. You've got to make it intuitive. It needs to make sense, and it needs to be entertaining. Um, not always entertaining, but at least a little bit, because you want people to go through the process of, of getting the phone out and going through the whole, the whole operation, or maybe it's through the uh, iPad. But um, those are the most important things to us, and then we test those, those, um, those scenarios a lot, and we try it with a lot of different people and get as much feedback as possible. Yeah, um, you know, I think, I think it's a, a great point of, like, give it to a three-year-old, right? Um, with a lot of the, the digital interfaces that we have now, you know, taps and clicks and that kind of thing are, are pretty well understood. But with AR, it's a whole new sort of terminology, uh, modalities that, that people just don't know yet. You know, is it, is it pinch to zoom or is it pinch to rotate? You know, like these, these aren't common standards yet. They're getting there, but um, at this point, we still need to be very explicit, right? It's bang him over the head with it because, you know, it's, it's still early yet, early days. And, and um, you know, maybe that becomes a little more common knowledge as to how people are supposed to interact with AR. But right now, it's, it's kind of the Wild West. So if you're doing it one way, make sure that it's very obvious what you're doing. Um, you know, it, it, it can be a little bit painful sometimes, and a lot of times it comes in very late in the game, and you maybe don't have time to, to run it through a focus group before you, you get it out there, but you know, find somebody in your office who has never seen this before and give it to them and say, hey, what, what do you think of this? How does this work? Watch them use it once before you ship this product because there's a very good chance you've done it completely wrong, even though you, it made sense at the time um, because, you know, those, the mindset that you have as somebody who is familiar with AR and who understands how it works is not necessarily the same as everyone who's going to be interacting with your, your product. Yeah, exactly. I uh, think also, uh, as you said, like give it to kids is really important. We need to, to treat adults as kids as well when they, they get a, a device with AR, like uh, it's not much difference. Um, and, um, Basically, entertaining the, the, the user is really important, uh, not only displaying information, but the entertainment, making it uh, cool and user-friendly. And in order to design those experiences, like um, you can do tons of Photoshop mockups, but nothing is going to replace prototyping. Like prototyping different user experiences, it's going to validate uh, if it's user-friendly or not, entertaining or, or not. Uh, there's no other ways you can prove it, like with AR, like designing a, a UI, or a static UI, 
uh, in Photoshop is not going to give you enough feedback to understand if it's going to work or not. So we're like, yeah, we really insist ourselves to prototype always, test prototype, test prototype, iterate, and see what works and what doesn't. Great, friends. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more on some of your techniques as far as prototyping goes? I mean, like, what's what's? Well, do you guys do paper prototyping, or or is it a Unity, or like, can you can you talk a little bit more about how you guys go about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, we we prototype always with uh, with Unity. So like, uh, we we just get things like going, like, put a few scripts, test things. Like, doesn't have to be pretty, but at least. Uh, have like some uh, some cubes and objects running around uh, and and see uh, how uh, user interaction works. Do you use Raycast? Do you use uh, Luca? Do you use other things like uh, just yeah like trying it with functional prototypes is really important. I'll just add on to that. Um, you know the the one thing that is a little bit unique about developing an augmented reality experience is that it's meant to be used in a physical space. So whether that's an image target on your desk representing a magazine that's going to be published or you know a billboard on the side of a building um, as much as you can do your testing in as close to that that real environment as you can get because you can't there, there are only a couple of cases where you can actually control that environment to the degree that you would want so you know start thinking about uh, you know that's that first prototype Okay, well, how is this actually going to be used? Where is this being deployed? Who is my user? Um, and what is the environment that they're going to be building this thing in? Because, you know, if, if you only ever run it on, in the editor <laughs> with the webcam, uh, that's probably not where your users are going to be playing it. So um, there will be some surprises when you put it on device and get it out in the real world. Yeah. I think for us, uh, MVP is is probably the most important part of that, the iterative devel development where you're building the, the absolute minimum viable product that you can to test each of the ideas. Uh, with that, I mean, you, you need to minimize the variables. So if you're prototyping in an MVP world, you're, you're creating things that really test exactly what it is you want to test. So if you want to test the UX, then you want to make sure that remove the other variables out of there because those other variables can cloud that testing. Um, but it's really important, especially if you have clients that you're working with, that they're a part of that iterative development, that they get to see each of these things and get their hands on it, because they're going to have feedback. And you don't want to get at the end of the project. You want to get that along the way. Um, otherwise, you'll be in a lot of, a lot of trouble. <laughs> Great, so I consider you guys pioneers in AR doing so much stuff so early. Um, and I was just curious, you know, can you guys talk about some of the technical challenges that you guys have run into that nobody has solved before and you guys are running into this for the first time and, and maybe, you know what I mean, as in, the, in, the, in the sort of history and maybe some of the ways you guys solve those issues? Anybody want to start with that one? The, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, some of the biggest problems we face, I think, that I don't know about no, nobody solving them before, but uh, as the HoloLens came out, you know, this brand new platform, it's so exciting, it's wearable technology, it's, oh, it's all these things. Um, and, you know, and, and Microsoft did a great job of, of selling the HoloLens and telling you about how great it was going to be. But if you ever tried to develop anything for a HoloLens, you can have like four polygons and one, you know, and like one draw call. You know, if, if you have two, it's not going to work right. Uh, I mean, it's not quite that bad, but it's close. And so we have, have had to take it on with uh, like an automotive manufacturer. I mean, all you guys are here to talk about automotive, right? You want to see a car, you want it to look as real as it can look. And do that in a HoloLens. It's like, those things don't make sense in the same world. So how do you fake reflections? How do you fake all this stuff so that at least somebody for a few minutes thinks it's real? Um, one of, my, one of my old friends and a mentor told me once that never believe anything you see unless you faked it yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've had the, the benefit of being a, a showcase developer for a number of, of companies before it being one of them. Um, so we've been on that, that, that bleeding edge of what's coming next before it's next um, a couple of times. Um, you know, I, I remember the first, my, my day one at Trigger was working on uh, a project called Goal. Um, it was for the World Cup, uh, and it was using Smart Train and, and Smart Objects. It's with McDonald's, 
and I, I had just completed my interview, and I, I go in, and they explain the project to me. You're going to take your phone, scan the, scan the table with the McDonald's objects on there, and it's going to recognize the boxes, and you're going to be able to bounce a digital ball off the boxes. And it doesn't need to be a McDonald's box. It can be a, a cup. It can be a non-McDonald's project. Any, anything that you can put on that table, it's going to recognize, and you're going to be able to bounce an object off of it. And I was like, great, that's super cool. Please, God, don't, don't put me on that part, because that sounds really hard. <laughs> and that was my part. And um, you know, we're, we're working with Vuforia, and it's, you know, we're getting release builds like you know, day of, um, and you know, working with a technology that's still under development. And the, the work that, that Vuforia is doing is like, incredible. Um, but it's you know, really like very cutting edge technology. It's, it's hot off the presses. Um, and all that that implies, and trying to build a, a user-facing game around this, um, it was like, wow, that's that's hard and that's really cool. Um, so you know that that kind of interface of like brand new technology, um, really exciting partners, and a really exciting digital physical interface is you know that's where you want to live as a developer because that's where the the most amazing things happen. Yeah, for us, I think uh, one, one problem that uh, we ran into that wasn't really solved at the time was back in the days when we were starting to play with, uh, with Vuforia and AR for the first time. And we developed this game called uh, Warp Runner. So that was, uh, I couldn't remember which year we released it around, I think, 2012 or something like that. And uh, at some point, we, we migrated it to, to a user-defined target so we could uh, scan a surface. But the idea of the game was that you have a little character and you need to warp uh, the physical world to create uh, uh, holes or hills in order to make physics objects to uh, roll and activate buttons, etc., and uh, go over some surfaces. And um, in order to deform the physical world with the actual uh, video image still mapped on it, uh, that was quite tricky back in the days, and we were really thinking how to do that. Um, and, but it, it, it should be possible. We knew it was possible. We, but we didn't have the uh, shader experience to, to do that uh, when we had such a small team at the beginning when we created the company. Uh, and basically, we solved this issue looking, uh, went, we went to uh, the, um, the forum, the Vuforia forum, and then scrolled down some articles, like uh, some, some thread about deforming, warping, mapping uh, video on textures, etc. We found this one guy that actually did some kind of shader that kind of looked like that. And then I explained him uh, my, uh, what I wanted to achieve. And he was like, yeah, it should be doable with this. Let me modify it for you a little bit. Send it back the shader. Then we apply it in the project. Worked well. And then that's how we created the game. Uh, you can check out the videos. It's called Warp Runner. And uh, yeah, that was a really cool thing that we, we managed to do uh, with a little bit of help of uh, people from the forum. Oh, awesome. It's, I would love to hear those kind of stories where uh, the community helps each other out. Uh, but I do, we're sort of running out of time here, but I do want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, it's so awesome having this discussion. Um, we have France, Danny, and Scott. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate it, and have yourself a great show. Thank you.